It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesser from the CBS Television News staff, and August Hexer, Chief Editorial Writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Samuel J. Urban, Jr., United States Senator from North Carolina. One of America's favorite indoor sports is, of course, politics and criticism of politicians. Now, our politicians do get a lot of honors, but they also take a lot of abuse. And I'm afraid that sometimes we forget that they're under a tremendous strain, as witnessed by the death of some of our most prominent senators and congressmen within recent weeks. Now, our guest tonight is one of the most recent additions to the Senate. He succeeded the late Senator Hoey. I'd like to ask him, Senator Irvin, you've had a long, successful career as an attorney and as a judge in a comparatively small town in Morganton, North Carolina, and in, of course, in the state capital of Raleigh. Do you find life in Washington more of a strain? Well, I think that service in uh, either the Senate or the House of Representatives in Washington is quite a strain, particularly if one worries about his actions. You haven't had very long to worry yet, though, have you, Senator? Oh, uh, no, I have not. I've just been there for, since the 11th of this month. Well, could we ask you for a few personal questions about becoming a senator? What about the social life in Washington? Do you find it difficult to fit in? Are people very hospitable to you? Well, uh, I have never been more graciously received by any group of people in my life than I have by the other members of the Senate. Well, uh, what about the White House? Are you immediately invited in to see the chief executive? Are you taken to dinner at the White House when you arrive there as one of the 96 senators of the uh, United States? I think that I would be more likely to receive an invitation to the White House if I were not a Democrat. <laughs> I see. Senator, um, how did you feel that moment when you were sworn in on June 11th? Did you feel as if this was uh, about the biggest thing that uh, a man could have? Well, I don't know whether I was more thrilled by being appointed to the United States Senate than I was by being elected to state legislature in my home county. When was that? Uh, that was back in 1922, when I was about 26 years of age. Well, did your Senate appointment come to you as a surprise? It certainly did. I was a member of the state Supreme Court and had been, uh, as most uh, appellate judges are, living in uh, Ivory ta Tower for about six years. And uh, I was not expecting to be appointed to the Senate. Mm. Well, now, now, Senator, you were appointed by the governor, and uh, this office that you hold will last for how long? This office uh, under the governor's, the governor's appointment will last until uh, the general election in November. Then you have to run again? Yes, I'll have to run for an unexpired term of two years two years, and then you'll have to be nominated again in a primary and uh, then be re-elected if and you should run again. Yes. And you're, in, and you're in it for keeps, are you? I'm in it till uh, the folks tell me they don't want me anymore. Mm -hmm. And when they tell me that, I'm going to take off a few days and go fishing and go back to practicing law and enjoy myself. Well, Senator Irvin, what does a, a new senator do? Have you brought your family up to live in Washington with you and sort of settle down, or are you waiting for this uh, new uh, uh, election to come up? Well, I'm waiting till the... Democratic Executive Committee nominates me for the unexpired term and until I get elected. Besides, my family prefers North Carolina weather in the summertime to Washington weather. Well, now, did you buy a house? How do you live in Washington? What does the senator do when he well, gets there? Well, uh, most of them sort of live out of a suitcase. Uh, I stay in a, a hotel room. Senator Irvin, have you been uh, given any committee assignments yet? I've been appointed to the Government Operations Committee and the District of Columbia Committee. The Government Operations well, Committee? That's uh, Senator McCarthy's committee. Yes, Senator McCarthy is the chairman of the committee. That's a very important post for a newcomer, isn't it? Well, uh, they give a newcomer the things which are least desirable and... Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I'd like to ask you this, Senator Irvin. Don't you succeed to the, s the committee appointments of the Senator whom you succeeded, the late Senator Hoey? No, everything in the Senate, uh, like things in the Army, goes by seniority. As someone has said, uh, uh, serving in the Senate is just waiting for dead men's shoes. I see. Well, now on the Senate uh, Operations Committee, what do you deal with there? Well, the uh, principal functions of that committee are twofold. One is investigating, and the other is in uh, studying government reorganization. And I am on the su uh, subcommittee 
on uh, government reorganization, which is headed by one of the most charming members of the Senate, Senator Margaret Chase Smith from Maine. A Republican. A Republican well, who uh, could be admitted into the Democratic Party freely without requiring her to repent of her political sins and iniquities. I well, was just going to say, you have a very fine chairman, I think. Well, of I course, the United States Senate has been called the most exclusive men's club in the world, uh, Senator Irvin. Now, is this club, this men's club, uh, hospitable? Do they accept you in? Are you invited out in that when you first arrive in town, as you did in the last few weeks? Uh, they are, as I said, they have received me most graciously, and uh, uh, senators come and tell you, even the ones of the opposition, they say that no matter how much we may disagree on matters of politics, we're all personal friends. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator, uh, you come, of course, from a, uh, a, a great southern state, which is also a great tobacco state. Now, I've been wondering about this uh, recent uh, news about tobacco smoking and uh, well, disclosures about it. Has this affected uh, the people in your state, your tobacco growers, to any extent at all? Oh, uh, it has not yet, and I do not believe that it will. Well, uh, there's been other news about uh, farm programs and tobacco in the past several days. Are the tobacco growers affected by the stiffer controls that the administration is putting into effect? Well, I think that uh, they'll not be affected to any great degree in North Carolina because uh, that's one of our principal crops, and. Uh, we uh, grow certain types of tobacco that cannot be grown elsewhere. Well, actually, has this news actually been upsetting to your tobacco growers? Uh, it, I don't say that North Carolina is a one-crop state, but it's a certainly a very important crop, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, uh, a great money crop. Uh, I think most people go ahead and smoke regardless of the talk about it, and the ones that don't smoke uh, will chew. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, is the situation... Uh, regarding the, the smoking of tobacco likely to affect the uh, finances of North Carolina or the standard of living of the people there? Well, if uh, it, it would considerably if uh, there was a, a decrease in the tobacco sales because North Carolina's agriculture depends in large measure on tobacco. It's true we have many other crops such as cotton and uh, peaches and uh, truck farming, but the tobacco is a major item. I think uh, North Carolina is one of the most varied states, isn't it, for agricultural products? Yes. And tobacco, after all, it can only be grown on a comparatively small part, that I suppose, is true. of the land. So each farmer tends to have his tobacco field and then other crops besides. That's right. Well, Senator, you'll be up again for election, I take it, in November then, after the personal elections are I hope to be. confirmed. Now, what do you think will be the election issues in uh, your North Carolina state? Well, uh, I don't know that uh, uh, anything much except what would be in the country generally. Well, what about this problem? which we've heard so much about recently, of uh, integration of the, of the races in the schools. Well, that problem reminds me of the Baptist preacher that always preached on the doctrine of immersion. And his congregation got tired of hearing the same uh, sermon every Sunday, so they told him they wanted him to preach extemporaneously on a text that would be given to him after he got in the pulpit. <laughs> and so the committee the following Sunday gave him the text, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he read over the text, and after reading it over, he says, geography tells me that... Uh, the earth is one-fourth land and three-fourths water, and that brings me to my subject, the doctrine of Im immersion. <laughs> now, uh, uh, the people of North Carolina, as a, as a whole, both white and colored, prefer the integrated school system, as it, uh, the, uh, the uh, segregated school system as it now exists. There are a few persons that uh, prefer the Supreme Court ruling, but the majority of the people, both white and colored, are opposed to it. But is, a is their own preference the determining factor? After all, if it's uh, against the Constitution and the laws of the land to have segregated schools, won't that be a force? Well, uh, frankly, I have a little difficulty believing that's against the Constitution because the Constitution was the other way for 86 years. And I have a little difficulty giving mental assent to something that I don't think so. Well, nevertheless, uh, would you follow out the precepts of some of the other states and possibly set up private schools for colored uh, people? No, uh, North Carolina has never considered going to private schools. North Carolina believes in public education, and North Carolina has perhaps done more than any other s southern state to give both Negroes and whites equal facilities. Are the school districts segregated now along uh, residential and geographic lines so that uh, you'll have a segregated schooling no matter what you do? Um, well, it'd be impossible to uh, to gerrymander the districts because in the rural sections of the state, Negroes and white people live together on the same farms. 
In other words, you won't be able to do as is done in the, uh, in the North, of course, where uh, Negroes do tend to live in communities. Uh, it's the problem actually isn't as great as it might be in the South. That's true. And but will you you won't be able to district your uh, your in regions down there at all? In the towns, you can district the towns. In the country, rural sections, you cannot. I might say this. North Carolina employs more uh, Negro principals and more Negro teachers in its public schools than New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois all together. We have uh, about 8,000 colored teachers in North Carolina who are paid the same as white people, white teachers. But can you give equal facilities on the higher level of education in the colleges and university, law schools? Well, North Carolina has two very fine uh, state-supported uh, Negro institutions. North Carolina College for Negroes at Durham and the A&T College at Greensboro and two very fine teacher colleges. And I think they have uh, all those North Carolina College for Negroes and uh, the A&T College are the equal of practically any other schools of that types in the United States. Senator, we don't expect any trouble at all then, but you will put this law into effect, this edict of the Supreme Court. Well, I, I can't say exactly what will happen because uh, our people uh, are not used to uh, integrated schools, and we have developed a pattern of segregation. Of course, North Carolina has always been a law-abiding state. Well, I hope that everything will turn out very well and uh, in accordance with the Constitution of the United States. Thank you very much, Senator Irvin. It's a great you. pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speaker. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesser and August Texher. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Samuel J. Irvin, Jr., United States Senator from North Carolina. <coughs> they say everyone sees the watch on your wrist, and to be really well-dressed, every detail must conform, including your watch. Now, Longines makes a watch to fill every need and to suit every taste. The choice of models and styles is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art, exquisite in taste and finish, and literally for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches for every requirement, watches for dress and sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world, waterproof and shock-resistant watches for rugged service, Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and for scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence, which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch on your wrist is not only one of the finest watches made anywhere in the world, but equally important, it's the watch of highest prestige. And yet, unbelievably, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty, Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by LeCoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of LeCoultre, division of Longines Whitnor.